we are live. Welcome to the Bradbury Challenge. The... No. Nope. Did I just do that? <laughs> I, I really did just do too that. Too many shows. Too many shows. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong intro. <laughs> Lovely. That was classic. Okay, let's start this over again. <laughs> this is Literary Roadhouse. One short story, once a week. I'm Maya. I'm Remy. I'm Gerald. And I'm Anais. And this week we are discussing Attitude Adjustment by Tim Goutreau. This is a story in The Atlantic, and it is about a... a wow, just brain... Start over. This is a story in the Atlantic, and it is about a priest who has been in a train accident. He is covered with scars, and he's having memory difficulties. At the moment we meet him, he isn't really able to do a lot of services, and he's kind of afraid of doing a lot of the masses. And so occasionally he gets called in as a full-in priest, fill-in priest, but usually he sits at home and doesn't really do much. One day, his his um one day his gardener comes in after having stole a shotgun and he is doing he he's he's feeling real remorse about stealing this shotgun and the priest feels sorry for him a little bit later he comes back he comes to his home to do the grass and he's talking about the fact that he's selling off his tools in order to try to repay for the shotgun to try to buy the shotgun back what did he just do he he just, just, my brain's going to freeze. You, you can't do that. My brain freezes too easy, Rami. You know this. I'm horrible I'm at these summaries. It's, I'm horrible. It's motion <laughs> detecting lights. So I was sitting here. You're just moment. having fun because you're really in a CIA oh, really? facility. I, I see yeah, how this is. <laughs> the priest feels sorry for his gardener and decides that he's going to go buy a gun for the gardener to replace the gun that the gardener stole to help redeem him. In the process, the priest gets arrested for trying to buy a for trying to buy a weapon for an illegal immigrant, and he ends up going to jail while the gardener ends up getting sent back to Mexico. When he's out of prison, he goes he is allowed to um, help out with a service, and he helps with children. He does a children's service, and he's reading these stories to these children as they're sitting on his lap, and he asks the children what is the purpose of the story? And the story was really about a man who had been saved by the Samaritan and had been through some trauma. And the children gave all their reasons for why God would allow this man to have all this trauma happen to him. One of the reasons given was that the Jewish man needed an attitude adjustment. And as he's sitting there talking to the children about this, one of the kids asked him what happened to him. Did he get beat up like the Jewish man in the story? And he explains that he was part of a train accident. And the children start asking him about his pain and whether people helped him and whether people were nice to him. And he realizes that at the end of the story that sometimes the receipt of all of this wonderful attention and love may actually be reason enough for having gone through trauma. There's my crappy summary. <laughs> I'm so Perfect. bad at summaries. I, and then I wonder why my child can't do summaries. My daughter never was able to do summaries in school, and I wonder why. <laughs> so let's see here. Top level. How did everybody like this story? Just basic top level. Yeah, it was. Um, I enjoyed reading it. Uh huh. Um, but I hear a butt in there. Yeah, there's a butt. I'm sharpening um, my knives. <laughs> I've got That's my okay. pitchforks. Okay, there's a big distance between us. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It it just didn't move me. It didn't but, move you. Um, it was a I good little story. loved this story from the first sentence, and this is one of the reasons why I love just picking stories blind. Just just into Google, pick a, pick a story, just random, no idea who the author is, because I never would have found this author if I hadn't picked blind. And I love this story so flippin' much. How about you, Remy? Yeah, I liked it a lot, too. So it seems like we're all in agreement except for Gerald. So Gerald. Mm, yeah, but Remy was not very enthusiastic there, so I'm going to give him a little eye, too. <laughs> I, I think he probably liked it more than his sleepy head is letting on. It seems in his wheelhouse. Was there anything about the story that you didn't particularly like, Rami? Nope. See, there you go. I can okay. read Rami's facial there expressions you go, don't now. Judge. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we 
we've been doing this podcast long enough, I can read y'all's facial expressions. <laughs> we've, we've developed these techniques. You know that. So. <laughs> One of the things I really loved about the story, it's funny how things like fall into your lap when you need the most. And I think that's sort of what happens in the story. And I feel like that's what happened with reading the story in my own life, because I'm going through a whole bunch of upheaval right now. And this was like, somehow I received the best Buddhist reminder from a story about a Catholic priest. <laughs> and it was it was very refreshing. And as I was reading it, it felt tight. I didn't um, at any point I was waiting for like there to be a hiccup in the language or for the pacing to feel off. And at no point did I feel any of that. It felt like a very tightly constructed story. I, I had a Buddhism thought as well, especially during the confession section when the first woman comes in and she's confessing that she missed mass. And he's like, well, learn to miss mass. That to me felt very Buddhist. <laughs> it was so awesome. Yeah. Um, there was also a lot of humor in this story. Mm -hmm. uh, there were several points where I was cracking up, like the whole oh, scene God. when the priest is looking for like sectarian clothes and he shows up in a gun shop in a gun shop with no shoes, <laughs> short black pants and a black wife beater. And all of these like hardened like gun types are giving him the side eye like he's dangerous. <laughs> I was dying on every level. I was just dying. <laughs> and the confession about the pornography sites. Oh, yes. 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 Like, he said <laughs> you should go to the pornography sites and see. I mean, but you know what? It's funny because even though he had all these mental difficulties and he's having all these mental me problems, his the things he tells the people during confession seem really illuminating to me. That's why the story is genius. Okay, Gerald, Gerald, <laughs> right here. This is to you. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, because here's the thing. So it's like, it's like his brain had a reset, right? Like he is starting again from, scare, from zero. It's rejuvenating. And there's this fascinating way in which he has almost like a childlike sort of like response to things where he's like, I don't know what that is. I don't remember anything. I don't know what the social protocol here, but how about you just do this, this seems more direct to your problem. That seems, um, so it, it, it's just, it's very, it's very s smart. The way that without telling you, the author portrays how this mind that's being sort of rejuvenated and coming at things again is really getting to the truth of things. And then who ultimately gets to the truth of the entire point of the short story is the children at the end. So there's that parallel there. And then there's also this sort of other aspect to it, which is like, I don't get the sense he was ever a great intellect before the accident either. There's all these tiny clues where it's like he was never that bright, but somehow just shedding all the stuff that he had been sort of um, trained to think or nurtured to think by losing that, he becomes wiser in a way. Mm -hmm. I always used to say that children are much wiser than we give them credit for. And I felt like he definitely was mimicking that in his responses during confession. And I, I really... I was smiling during a large, great deal of the story. I was just kind of grinning to myself and I kind of loved him. Like <laughs> Jim is just such a wonderful character. <laughs> I like, I'm, I'm like, just I laughing because I'm thinking of when he's in the gun store and they're like, what do you want this gun for? And he goes to kill. <laughs> And he's trying to use a priestly tone, but it comes off totally not priestly at all. <laughs> but I was, why did he say to kill, though? Because he couldn't think of an answer. <laughs> that, but, that's why. Like, but is that's like, what your gun's used for, to kill. So he's like, But he no. wasn't. In, in reality, he was getting it for the gardener to be able to re replace the one he sold off to his uncle. So it wasn't. Yeah, yeah, but he can't think logically. The way his brain works, I've actually known people with these types of brain injuries. It's like it's it's like you ask them a question and they can't think about the answer, just random thoughts or answers will pop into their head and like like ideas. And so when he's asked, What do you need the gun for? instead of thinking, I'm getting the gun to give to my gardener so that he can use it to repay his brother who he stole a gun from. He, th his brain's like, what are guns for? Kill, like that. <laughs> like, like there's like a whole like missing thought process there. And it explains that. It explains the question seemed odd to the priest, and he thought the salesman wanted the most basic answer. So he, it's kind of like the child just producing the answer that the adult wants. It's like that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Like, uh, okay, this is the right answer. Yeah, and the whole thing, like, oh yeah, I'm getting it for somebody else. <laughs> like he just walks right into it. Gerald keeps doing sassy eyebrows. Come on, Gerald. <laughs> 
You're gonna have a lot of muttering to find in this episode, aren't you, Annie? I just see these eyebrows like going, hmm, hmm, hmm. I, I feel like the only sober guy at the party. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's cracking up. Isn't that how so... you always feel, Gerald? <laughs> no, it isn't. And it's so funny. And I'm thinking, yeah, it's a bit of amusing, I suppose, a bit. <laughs> but um, I don't, yeah, I, I don't know why I'm not seeing it, why I'm not feeling it. But it, it's, you know, I liked. It's like superficially, I like the story, and and it's a, you know, it's a good story, and it trundles along quite happily, and 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 it's 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 nice. And then there's this sort of you know, cheesy, blooming, you know, parable thing at the end. And, and you just think, yeah, that's, that's, that's a bit obvious. So, I'm the one that hates parables. How did this get flipped, Gerald? <laughs> Usually I'm the one that's like, ah, parables. So now we know that Gerald hates children, putting that out yeah. for our <laughs> listeners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> spoken like I hate parent. English gardens. I hate English gardens. Bring me an English garden. I hate your story. <laughs> you also hate New England coasts. Yes, yeah, I'm yes. done. I'm but done. Only, with the main only coast. when someone is driving through them feeling yeah. grief. <laughs> yeah, do not feel grief on the New England coast. <laughs> That's not a good one. So I'm going to start with Gerald. Gerald, what do you think the point of this story is? Like, I think we're all going to come to a similar conclusion, but I just want to make sure. What do you think, like, the point of the story is? The point of the story is to make me grumpy. That's, that's the whole point I don't think the author set out to Did say, okay. I'm going to write this story to make Gerald grumpy. <laughs> it's possible. Should, this podcast sure, yeah. was already in existence when this was written, so possible. <laughs> there you go. Um, <laughs> I, it's, I, I suppose that the point of the story, I, I, I think the point of the story is that, um, yeah, you can have bad stuff happen to you, and when bad stuff happens to you, it happens for a reason. You may not understand the reason at first, but but then you know everything is revealed at the end, and 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 I just think, nah, no, I, I don't, I don't get that sort of this whole God works in mysterious ways thing. It's um, so maybe that's the disconnect here. <laughs> uh, so on your side, I will say that I've said that expression, but only in joking because, like you, I think it's kind of silly. But what I don't find silly and what I think the story was about is even during trauma or bad things that are happening, there are lessons, there are positives that can be gained from it. So when you've experienced something that's really bad, it doesn't have to stay bad. Like there can be things that come as a result of it that you might not have experienced to begin with. So in this case, this, this man, he's been a priest for a really long time. I get the idea that he was kind of just like he was a priest in the way that an IT guy is an IT guy. It's just what he does. He goes to work every day. He puts on his black clothes. He goes into the church. He spouts his Latin, goes home, goes to sleep. Hate mail goes to literaryroadhouse.com. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> <laughs> 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 IT guys. <laughs> Hey, you guys. <laughs> and people they'll, they'll hack you. <laughs> so <laughs> the point is the point the point for me is that this guy was living this very perfunctory life and now he's had this horrible trauma where people look at him, he's losing his memory, and what's happened as a result? His best friend now is his gardener. Very simple, simple, simple things give him give him pleasure now. You know, he doesn't like doing the big masses and that word that I can't pronounce that was throughout the whole story. I'm assuming that's when they speak tons of Latin, the whole holy homilies, homilies, homilies. Mm -hmm. homilies. He doesn't like doing that. It's complicated. But what does he like? He likes reading the stories to the children. He likes the simple things, you know, when he's doing confession, he doesn't like confessions face to face. Cause he doesn't always feel like he knows what to say. He doesn't like doing them at all because he feels like he doesn't know what to say, but he always seems to know what to say, you know, and in, during his homily where he's talking to his parishioners, instead of coming out with some long, drawn out, complicated story and analysis that is acceptable, he says things that are really off the cuff and slightly out of left field, but they're really deep and enlightening. And so 
he's been reduced to this very, very simple existence that is allowing his inner genius to come out, which is a positive. And he's starting to find joy in really small things like the, like the love and the compassion from these children at the end of the story. That is a simple pleasure he would not have experienced previous to the accident. And so to me, that's what the story is about. It's not like God works in mysterious ways and some some great God is sitting on a cloud somewhere saying, I'm going to make something bad happen to you so you can learn a lesson. But it's more about bad things happen and you can you can either wallow in the bad things that happen. You know, he could have just hold himself up, never left the house, or you can still attempt to live your life as best as you can and gain the joy that you still can from it. You can make lemonade, Beyonce reference. <laughs> necessary how long have you been waiting for that Annie? the whole time the whole time, <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> wow. um I, I was just gonna add to that though so i don't think at the beginning of the story he actually liked the children's sort of church leading sessions he kept saying like okay he gets why he has to do it but because you know he has limited functionality right now but um Right. But by the end of it, he realizes why. But he wants, remember when he gets out of jail, he wants like full responsibilities at a church and he doesn't get that. He does the church thing. He's like, okay, happy to help. And that like, he's not actually, you know, he's going to do it, but that's not what he wants to do. Um, and during the confession, so you said that he always says the right thing, but it's interesting to me that the adult confessioners don't seem to think so because no, they don't. no there's a script right like they're supposed to get hail marys or whatever <laughs> our fathers in like the hundreds or something crazy like that forgiven go back do what they're supposed to do and come back the next week like yeah that's the rules dang it right and he he used to be a part of that like pre-accident he knew the script he knew like they say this now i say this please don't cry that's really awkward right like it's like let's just get here and like say our lines and fulfill our roles and then now that he's had this accident he's like freed from that script because he literally cannot remember it and that's how the right thing like the whole instead of say i love the scene where he tells the guy who's addicted to pornography to go to the burger king and watch his niece work and see her her triumphs and her humiliations and the guy's like can i just get some hell marys he's like no <laughs> Because like, all right, that's weird. We're fine. <laughs> yeah. but I think I do understand why Gerald might not like the story because I would, I think in a previous story, I have taken a stance where if I don't agree with the message, then that affects the way I appreciate the story as well. And I think, you know, Maya, you had criticized me for it before, but I mean, I, I'd still do it. In this case, I do agree with the message and I do uh, think like, you know, everything happens for a higher purpose and, and, and stuff like that. So. <laughs> yeah. We it agree with the is. message, but for two completely different reasons. And that is what I find so interesting about you, Remy. In a lot of ways, we actually go through life with a lot of the same like base assumptions, but for two completely different reasons. And I think that is so interesting when I talk to you, Remy. <laughs> I, I also I also have a, a bit of a problem with, with him driving around when he doesn't remember driving. <laughs> and I think you're supposed to have a problem. I, it's, it's, I don't know. Well, you know what? I think I've been behind people having that situation. Yes, it is dangerous. <laughs> I was walking into a gas station. And some lady was driving so slow to get into the gas station that I was afraid for her. I thought she was going to actually run into the gas station. And she was just really, really old. And honestly, she should not still be driving. And there's this thing where, like, I, I, I hate that that happens, but I can understand it. Like, especially that generation, like when you got your driver's license, that was like a sign of freedom. That was a sign of independence. And when you're like sick or you're having a disease or you're super elderly, that is like the last thing you want to give up because it's like saying, okay, I'm no longer capable of being a self-sufficient human being. Oh. And a lot of people that should not be driving have a hard time with that to the point where like, I can't think of anybody like I've known a lot of older people. I can't think of anybody that's voluntarily given up their license. It's always been something the doctor put their foot down. Like I'm, I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, mom was doing road trips when honestly she probably shouldn't have been able to be driving. 
life anymore. <laughs> She's driving cross country to visit her sister. So I'm like, oh God, oh God, oh God, twisty roads. <laughs> yeah, my, my, my dad was like that. He, it was, it was, and it was, especially with males, I, I think sometimes it, it, you know, it's, it's a male chauvinist thing. You know, no one's going to tell me I can't drive because I can drive. <laughs> Um, which I don't have, of course. And what's funny, you said that's males. I've heard that exact same phrasing come out of a woman's mouth. Really? I've been on this earth for 80 some odd years. You're not going to tell me I can't drive. I know how to drive. I've been driving for... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, okay, grandma. <laughs> and in, in the story, uh, the author stays very, very, very close to Jim's point of view. Like it's like a little camera on his shoulder and he only pulls away like once or twice to make like a little joke. And it, it, that was one of them. The driver's license was like, Father Jim, who for some reason still had a driver's license, told him he would be there on time. Like he has these little pops in there, but very few. Like he's very um, uh, restrained in how he does it. Yeah, he's kind of set up these rules for himself, memento style, you know, mm -hmm. like if he has to remember something, he'll set his clock and then he'll put the note under the clock. And if he has to go somewhere, he'll remind himself of the directions like every minute until he gets there, even though he doesn't remember driving his his physical reflexes, remember how to drive. And I, I found it interesting that until he went to jail, nobody said anything about his driving. But once he came out of jail, the priest, the the diocese, they're like, uh, maybe you shouldn't be driving for a little while. <laughs> like, then they get that maybe he shouldn't be driving. And that's the point where he's actually getting better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This also had that thing that I love. So uh, even though the story is very different from anything Saunders does, it's nothing like Saunders, but it has one thing in common, which is that the author trusts the reader to be smart like it, it's dealing with some very, very heavy issues. This could be a sob story so easily. Like he didn't have to tell you that it's kind of an injustice that this guy got arrested. Like there's no reason that guy should have served any jail time, but he doesn't have to tell you that. Like, you know that even though you're in his point of view and while this indictment's going on, he's just like sitting there like so happy he remembered a memory, which makes sense. That's his reality. He's just like, oh my God, I remember who this lawyer is while he's like being indicted and under some very serious charges. Um, and I like that the author trusted the reader. Like he doesn't have to tell you this is sad, this is unjust, this is ridiculous. Oh. So at what point? Because we've we've gone through other stories where the author trusts the reader, and it was a problem for people. Usually not for me because I'm just that mean. Um, so at what point do you think trusting the reader crosses over to leaving the reader adrift? Yeah, that's what I have an issue is uh, with. I think. Um... You know, assuming some kind of knowledge or, or deductive reasoning on, on behalf of the reader is fine. But like when just things are just up for interpretation, like too much and, and, and just like too many blank spaces that need to be filled. That's when I get thrown off by, by a story. Mm -hmm. How about did you, that, Gerald? Did that happen? I was just going to ask Grammy, did that happen in this story or not? No, no, for this one, no. Okay, that's good. I, I think maybe it, it, it depends on who your intended audience is and um, what was the story? I'm trying to remember. There was a story we were arguing over whether or not the author had to tell you murder was bad. <laughs> like, remember? What, was, what story was it? And I was very firmly in the position of he doesn't need to tell Duh. you. Like, <laughs> I remember this, but I can't remember the story. We've read so many stories. At I, this know, point. I know. <laughs> but I remember this argument where I was like, doesn't have to tell you that. But so I think this is one of those stories as well, where he sets up the problem in a way where the intended audience, most Westerners who read this are going to are, don't need to be told it's bad because it's like knee jerk bad. Like it, there's no gray area here. Like few people there's except for like maybe like like very kind of strict authoritarians are going to be like well he was technically you know buying a gun for felon so i guess he should be in jail forever very few people are going to feel like that's just yeah but at the same time there's no real way that he understood that the guy was a felon like that's what's funny about it because he he understood that he had stolen his brother's gun but to make that connection that he's now a felon and unable to have firearms, like, like it's that, right. It's the intention of the innocence. Make. Hmm. And then there was an innocence about him, but even on a more basic level, you know, I I've 
heard from multiple people on this podcast that they don't like stories where they have to look up a word. <laughs> yes, I'm staring at Gerald. <laughs> But there were religious terms in the story that I don't know. I'm not Catholic. Um, I haven't even been in a Christian church since elementary school. But everything was done in context in such a way that I didn't need to know the exact definition of this particular type of mass. Like, I kind of got the point. Like, Mm. he's going, it's more complicated. It's not the general talking. It's something that's probably a little more analytical and that's what he's uncomfortable with. I didn't have to figure that out on my own because it was kind of just embedded in the knowledge of the story. Um, and, 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 they, and they weren't an in, uh, intrinsic part of the story. It was, it was just part of his life and what he did. So it, you could sort of, I, I don't know what they, what they mean. I've heard the term, so but I can sort of step over them and, and uh, it's just a point of reference. Yeah. So do we want to talk about the language in this story? Because that's where I got impressed. Um, You know me, Annie's. I I read a story and I'm just waiting for the language to fall down. It's the old poet in me still likes to rear its ugly head and be like, the rhythm in that is off. And um, this, the language in the story was very tight, meaning at no point was I reading this story and I thought this didn't need to be there. This sentence is too slow. This could have been said differently. Like it was as close to flawless as far as language usage that I've read in a while. There have only been a few stories that I've read that way where it's like literally language level is flawless. Um, Alice Monroe is one of them. Um, flawless at no point in any either of her stories that I feel like that language is a mess. Um, but most stories, there's something I can pick out. And this story was just so tight, so well edited, so well executed. Um, craft, like that's the word that comes to me when I find a story that's just tight is the word craft. Mm-hmm. And it's something that I'm just in awe of because I so don't have that. And I'm like, how does he do that? And that's how I felt reading this story. And by the end of the story, I was kind of in shock at, at the fact that at no point did the language let me down. Yeah, it was it was it was very 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 well written. It's a, you know, he he's he's obviously very good at at, at writing, um, and 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 it yeah, it, there was no point at which you felt that there was filler or it was, um, and 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 it had um, an Anais's that sort of ups and downs with the the tension and and. Uh, so that, that that gets a tick too. So it's yeah, it was really well written. How about you, Remy? Were were there any parts of the story that felt slow to you? Any parts of the story that felt maybe overly lyrical, not lyrical enough? No, I mean you threw a, a lot of superlatives at it. So um, <laughs> I agree. It, it was very uh, tight and compact and and well crafted. Hmm. Um, so I, there was a point where even though I was enjoying it and I was laughing, I actually stopped just to see what he was doing with pronouns, <laughs> like, because okay. it was, it, which is so odd that because it was so obviously masterful in its craft that, so like, sometimes I feel like I'm getting repetitive with pronouns. I'm like, how do I handle all the he's and she's and everything like that? And then I just stop and I just start analyzing like how he does this in, in, in the paragraph where it's a play by play of just one character alone doing something in a room when he's picking out the clothes. Like, how do you stop it from just being like, he did this and he did this. Um, so just on a very technical level, it was genius. But then I also liked how he handled um, descriptions. So one of my favorite parts was when he's describing the ATF agent's face. So the narrator, you're in his point of view and he, he can't, so the expressions are in a way very political. Some, anyone who's kind of like awake to the way that, that um, law is enforced in the United States would look at that and be like, oh, I know why he's stony faced there. Oh, I know why he's looking really happy there. The narrator doesn't have that because of the accident. But as the reader, I totally understood what the author's going for based on like five words, six words. It was just so precise. Um, and also fear came up a lot. And I didn't notice it until I started skimming it a second time. 
And I like how the fear would refer back to the accident with these uh, very kind of simple metaphors that weren't over the top. They didn't have that kind of like MFA feeling of like, this is a metaphor, feel it. <laughs> it was just here it is. It was very kind of plain and blunt. And I really enjoyed the way that he did that. Yeah, yeah. plain. Yeah, were, I think it's a good idea. There were lots of um, railway metaphors and, and, and references, which which was, again, as you say, Annie, it's not overdone, just lightly done. And, and you know, tracks were mentioned and, and uh, something about, yeah, the scar uh, on his head going forward to his eye eyebrow, yeah. like a track. Um, he said, it, he said his, his mind was like carriages without bumpers or something like that. It, it, it's, uh, but that, that that was really well done. Excellent mm -hmm. segue into symbolism because trains um, definitely was a strong symbol throughout the story. It was reflected in the descriptions of his scars. It was reflected in the descriptions of his thoughts. It's what caused the accident. And when I think of a train, what does a train do? It takes you someplace. It takes you on a journey. It takes you from point A to point B. And throughout the story, that's what's happening to him. He's going from a place of not remembering anything to starting to have his memories come back. He's also coming from a place of, you know, not really having a lot of joy in his life to receiving a ton of joy from something really simple. And so I, I feel like that was such a well done metaphor because it's throughout the entire story, but it doesn't bang you over the head with it. Yeah. I also like the idea that he doesn't see it coming at all. Like train horns are not subtle, but it goes with that general theme of like, because at the end, the point it, that he makes is you don't know where the pain comes from or why. And it's kind of funny to have it brought in by a train, which is not subtle. It's like, like it's coming at you. It's hard to miss. And yet he misses it. So I like that parallel as well. I, I also found it interesting that he didn't hear the train. And the reason why he didn't hear the train is because he was focusing on his, on his next talk to his parishioners. Like, like he was so into the job of being a priest that he was just distracted as he was driving, as he was going through this talk that he was going to give and he wanted it to be perfect, but he literally didn't see what was in front of his face. And I think that is an important metaphor for a lot of religious leaders, just leaders in general. You're so focused on being the perfect leader that you miss the most obvious things that are in front of you. And I think that was a really important metaphor for me. Mm -hmm. Did all right. I'm sorry. Carry on. <laughs> oh no! I I was just gonna say that I also like this slightly, very like we were saying. It's a very light touch with his symbolism, and also he's got all these. The author has all these little political things to say as well. So there's the way that the ATF agent reacts. There's the low hanging fruit bit that the that the lawyer and the narrator's father says there's that line about regulations that he just didn't understand the regulations like walking into a spider web and getting in trouble for walking into a spider web and then i just i thought it was really funny so he has all these little political things that he drops in and then he just sort of like dismisses it by having somebody else seem even more imperious by having the bishop be like yeah washington thinks it's the vatican like it's so ridiculous that it's just I, yeah. <laughs> it's like this whole other like side you know how i like all my side plots there's just all like other like side point going on that I were there any other one. symbols that you guys spotted as you were reading the story? I don't know if this counts as a symbol, but I liked the exchange between him and Nestor, the gardener, after he had um, gotten in hot water over it, because there was a bit of uh, like language, literally language exchanges when he said, hola, Nestor, and then Nestor replies, sup. You know, like he, he speaks <laughs> English, and then he says, when he's asking if he wants, if the priest wants Nestor uh, for him to intervene to like ice or something, <laughs> and then he says, Esta segura? and he's like, I can speak English probably better than you now. You know, <laughs> I chuckled at that part. It was, it was quite wonderful. <laughs> and, and how the priest had a fear that he would wake up when he would wake up unable to in anything other than Spanish, which would be a horrible thing because he can hardly understand Spanish. That like totally made me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> so did anybody else enjoy, this is going to sound really messed up, but okay. 
in our modern view of Catholic priests and their interactions with little people, I found a great deal of just slight, like, twisting at, at the reader and just kind of niggling them just a little bit as the children are like around him and they're climbing on his lap and they're leaning on his back and it's so innocent but in the back of your head because you're an American and you've been re watching the news for like the last 15 years you're just like waiting for something really bad to happen. No, that's, that's not that didn't enter my mind that's because you're innocent Remy no, and I think it's like you said, it is a product of, you know, being exposed to the news and stuff. But regardless, I, I don't think that's the right, that was the writer's intent whatsoever. But I think that the writer just kind of had fun with the reader a little bit with that. I think that was done on purpose. And I think it was to show his innocence and our uninnocence. If yeah. that's not a word, but or it's a it word now. Be. So as the reader, we are not innocent because we've been ingesting all this stuff for so long but he's completely innocent and when you look at most grown men now that have been watching the news for the last 15 years most of them would feel uncomfortable a bunch of strange children climbing all over their laps like i know guys that won't let their daughters sit on their lap anymore because they're just freaked out by all this crap in the news and to see his really innocent lovely interactions with these children was such a breath of fresh fresh air and it totally was just like hmm reader i know you <laughs> and, and i i would say if it is intentional i would think that i mean no i i do think it was intentional but it may have been for the for the purpose of countering that uh mm. narrative or that assumption exactly. that we're to priest yeah. and, and returning them to, to being you know good intention decent people because i i was just reading over this guy's wikipedia page and when asked how he would describe himself he he said because he he lives in the south of the united states like i think out of tennessee or or uh louisiana something like I that. i think but it's anyway. washington because leavenworth penitentiary is up in washington state no no, no i'm talking about the writer not the priest so, oh the writer the yeah, priest, yeah. yeah so he he was asked you know would you describe yourself as a southern writer and he he his response was no i just happened to be a writer, I happen to be a writer who just happens to live in the South. And he said he would identify himself more as a Roman Catholic. So yeah, he, he does have those religious. And I, and I think that's what was so beautiful about that messing with the reader just a little bit, because it did allow you to see this wonderful priest and, and to reinstate his innocence and, and to see these interactions in a healthy way. And I just really enjoyed that. <laughs> that, that, I, I, yeah, like you, I, I think it, I think it was deliberate, and I was recoiling in horror as the kids <laughs> climbed over over him, and I was like, Whoa, "You no, pervert! No, How no, dare no, you no. have those thoughts?" I know. <laughs> no, but but it makes sense to me because Gerald, as a modern man, needs to like be aware He's been of inundated, and yeah. and I know just from my experiences with men that that is a constant worry that something they do might be perceived in in a way that's not meant. Mm -hmm. And the and the fact that he does not have that perception shows you his innocence and and shows you just just the pure natural reaction that should be happening. And I, I think that's why I love the fact that he kind of messed with me a little bit. and was like, <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. You. I agree. He was like, oh, do you think this is creepy? Because is it, is it creepy? Like he was definitely <laughs> needling. Yeah. yeah. And I also like the allegory to Frankenstein's monster. Right. So that's the kind of like the more yeah. sort of like overt because the monster is very innocent and is fumbling and is just going through society and doesn't understand how anything works and all the unspoken rules. And you have that again. So it's kind of like a modern Roman Catholic Frankenstein. You know, it's funny, I did not make that connection, but now that you say it, it's so obvious. Yeah. Right down to the extent of his scars and how big he is. Like you don't yeah. think about a Catholic priest being six four, three hundred pounds and just And he like, goes out barefoot. Big, scary like, guy. Mm. And the fact that he scares a bunch of like right wing gun people in a gun store just by being there yeah. <laughs> being kind of oblivious. Yeah, mm. I, I thought that was quite wonderful. It's Are we ready to rate this thing or is there anything else that we would like to discuss? Yeah, I was, I was just gonna say it's it's um you got Beauty and the Beast as well, where where you've 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 got this outwardly huge disfigured creature 
um, who's actually, you know, really, really gentle. Um, and also, I just wanted to say, um, did anyone else think that, that the, the quality of the writing at the start was different to the end? Because I thought I, I thought the, the opening sort of page, couple of pages, um, were really strong, really cleverly written, really beautifully written. And then it sort of became a da 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 this happened then that happened sort of thing. I didn't have that experience. I felt like the entire story was extremely well written, but I had the experience of the writing felt like it was changing in the same way that the character was changing. Like I definitely felt like the writing was taking a journey as well. And and I don't know if maybe that's what you were picking up. I enjoyed how it changed, but I can see how it could be perceived in a different way. Because at the beginning, you're right. It's very clever. It's mm. very um, technically savvy. Yeah. And then it starts to go into really simple language. But to me, that was a reflection of his own inner state. So once they got away from describing his surroundings and describing how he lives in the world and actually describing his thoughts and his interactions with the gardener, then the language becomes more simple because he is more simple. I think naturally a story would change in terms of the language because just describing like the making an introduction and describing the background and, and setting the stage is different from the actual like play by play events that are going on. Like I, I wouldn't know or no story comes to my mind of thinking like that same tone of like the introduction, like the once upon a time part doesn't it's just the opening you know it's, it's you can't kind of maintain that for the <clears throat> well the beginning is very narrative and yeah. where it becomes more simple is, is where the dialogue starts to come in and where he's actually interacting with people and i think well done narrative is always going to feel more clever than well done dialogue because when you're talking dialogue and interactions you're at the mercy of the intelligence of the characters that you're describing and so for me, that change felt very natural. Um, and I have to say, I was impressed by the fact that the narrative was really long. The narrative section was fairly long, but didn't lose me. And I didn't feel bored at any time mm. during that part. And I'm prone to that sometimes when it's done badly. I love well done narrative. I especially appreciate it because I am so bad at it. Mm -hmm. um, but I felt like it really had a rhythm and a pace that kept me interested and, and just I felt almost seduced by the story as I was reading it yeah it, it was yeah. I, I think the pacing was 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 really good and, and I, I have just just one more niggle <laughs> just only the go one. for it um what about poor Nesta through through the the, the, priest, the priest's actions he was he was a he was a nice guy but uh, you know, a little bit misguided or something, and and now he's got sent back to to Mexico, and and nothing. It's that's just part of the story. There's no sort of so he, Nesta has suffered because of of what what um, Jim has done, but it, nothing's made of that. It's I actually think something was because Nesta at one point says none of this would have happened if I hadn't have stolen. Hmm. He takes responsibility for all the further actions. And and to me, here comes another parable part oh. where it's, you know, it's a ripple in a pond. You do one thing and then there's all these rippling effects. And I think that Nestor understood that the priest was doing what he did out of love and attempt to help. And I don't think he blamed him because he's the one that stole in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't blame the I don't blame the priest either for what happened to Nestor. And um, there's that one line where he's talking to all the officials and the agent, the lawyers, and he's describing the, the one who's as skinny as a teenage girl. And he's like, but the little man's voice contained a trace of governmental demon, a connection to knotted regulations more difficult to understand than religious mystery, which at least could be believed through faith, as many arbitrary governmental strictures could not. So, like, there's this sense of the Frankenstein monster again, like it doesn't, his intentions were good. I don't, I think he's a little blameless here. He just doesn't understand what he's dealing with. Like this, this is definitely not a person who should be living alone. Number one, like why is he even living alone? Um, so 
yeah, I think Nestor understands that too. And I think through Nestor's understanding and Nestor's willingness to take on the blame, then I, as the reader, I'm like, okay, if Nestor isn't mad at him, then I'm not mad at him either. But also Nestor's story has this whole political side. Okay, yes. Where Nestor is here and he's done this bad thing, you know, but why is he here? He's sending money back home. Okay. Why did he sell the gun? You know, why did he steal it and sell it? Why did he get rid of his tools needed to do, to do the grass? Like he, he, he's, he has a really, he has an innocence about him too. And, and like the priest, he gets caught up in the rules. These are things that you do. These are things that you don't do. And these are the repercussions. And it does, it does ask some pretty muddy questions, you know, because usually when we talk about immigration, we talk about, you know, um, who should stay and who shouldn't. We usually start the first, the low hanging fruit that everyone agrees on seemingly is that if you've committed a crime or you've done something bad, obviously those people should be deported. And what do we think of when we think of those people? We think of rapists and murderers. Hello, Trump. And so <laughs> more hate mail to literaryroadhouse.com. <laughs> Just direct it directly to Maya. And so, <laughs> and so by muddying this water, muddying this idea of, yes, he committed a crime, but why did he do it? Like his reasoning he's not a bad guy, you know? And, and so it, it takes this fairly clean breaking line that kind of is like the line that the liberals and the conservatives agree on and makes it all kinds of gray and messy. And his, his getting sent back home and his accepting of getting caught in that web was also very instructive. He didn't complain. He didn't freak out. He didn't sneak back in, you know, which is what we've been told people in those situations do. And so, yeah, this, this story to me has a lot of different messages and I really appreciate how subtly they're introduced. So, and it does leave it up to the reader because you could read the story and totally not think about the immigration debate or anything at all, mm -hmm. but it's there if you want to go dive a little deeper into the analysis. Yeah. I, 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 I also... I, sorry. I, I, I thought the Nesta thing was just a little bit preachy. You do bad, you're going to suffer, and and it, it's it's like the writers telling us, you know, this this little guy who just just makes pennies or something. Um, yeah, he stole he stole a gun from his brother, so he's got to go back, and 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 that's it. And there's nothing, there's no, you know, it's, it's very black and white. There's there's no there's no gray area with it. Yeah, there, there's no allowing for the fact that he's trying to pay this back, that he's trying to oh. repurchase it for his brother. And the reason why he stole it was, again, for another completely stupid, innocent reason. Oh. <laughs> like, it's so stupid. <laughs> it's like, you're going to get sent back to Mexico for the stupidest reason ever. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's funny that you read it that way, Gerald, because I don't I don't see it as the story saying you do bad, you're going to get your comeuppance. In the case of Nestor, I feel like the story, or maybe you just have to read it very liberally to just sort of get there on your own, like, you know, know that, that that or hope that that's what the author's trying to say. I don't think the author's trying to say that Nestor should have been deported um, because he's so critical of the regulations that lead to that to that end result. Like he he, he assigns all this evil to the fact that the priest goes to jail and Nestor gets deported, that I think you can walk away with it fairly certain that it's not that Nestor got his just dessert. I agree with Annie's, but you know, she's my podcast wife, so I have to. Yeah. Podcast wives. <laughs> <laughs> no. But 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 yeah, but I can see how how because it has all of this religious overtones, yeah. not undertones, okay. you know, how you it might can be see that way. Mm-hmm. And, and and maybe that's maybe that's my own personal undertone with the story is is that I I, I don't you know I'm not a fan of religious religious religion based stories so so maybe I, it, it's skewing my my view of it um, but but so uh, there you go that's fair that's fair Deal that is it. fair now my question is this story has religious characters, but 
is it a religious based story? I well, we we we've talked we've we've talked about you know we've, we've talked about two things, haven't we? We've talked about the um, you know the the, uh, the 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 great sort of not understanding God's plans thing um, that 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 Rami saw, uh, and we've also talked about the 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 way that sort of fate can take a a, a hand and and can through something bad happen you can learn something you know you can learn good things and do good things um and you can get nice little mexicans deported but uh, <laughs> 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 so so i i th it, it feels like a religious story to me and, and and i'm i may be over 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 staring at it um because of that but, you know, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but it, it definitely feels like a religious story. To me, it feels religious based because mm -hmm. the characters are in a religious environment. The gentleman is a priest, but the lessons in the story don't feel like religious lessons to me because I talk to atheists that talk about, you know, things don't happen for a reason, but you can decide to look at them in a positive or a negative way. You can choose to take positive things out of something that's negative that's happening, even though they don't believe in God, they don't believe it's been some divine action that caused it. And to me, I think that this story is like a Rorschach test in how you see the world. If you see the world in terms of God and in terms of religion, you're going to see things work in mysterious ways. God doesn't, not, negative things happen without a reason. Like those are the types of lessons you're going to see in this story. But if you don't have that paradigm, you can very much read the story in an atheist way. So I don't actually think the story is a religious story. I think it is a moral story. Like, but I think the morality in the story can be either religious or non-religious. And happens to have and, a priest character <laughs> yeah, I, gerald's eye so if we read a story with a black character in it is it a black story like <laughs> i'm just gonna go there <laughs> we're talking religion why not I can't, wait. I can't wait for saturday it's gonna be a good <laughs> <laughs> to, to Gerald's point, to Gerald's point, though. So I totally agree with what Maya is saying in that the preachiness is not distinctly Catholic and that the preachiness doesn't require you to be religious. Its morals are not religious. But there is something about it that is a little bit like Catholic Redeemer. Like you read the story and the picture you get of Catholicism is quite rosy and sweet and very different from the sort of... Uh, the bad press that it often gets and all the issues that are within that institution. So I think if you're somebody who is possibly critical already of Catholicism as an institution, you might be like, hmm, like side eyeing. Like, I think there is like a little, a little activism here to redeem the church. Yeah. And, 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 and I won't and take that have, away from it. You do have a priest who, who is not capable of doing his job still being employed as a priest. <laughs> Gerald, like, so that Gerald, tell fly. us how you really feel. <laughs> just, you know, just put that out there. <laughs> and that hate mail. <laughs> I, I'm gonna, I, I'm to gonna Gerald. shut up now. Yeah. Gonna... Well, I do think it's a religious-based story because I was just thinking to myself, if the story didn't have any religious characters, I would still attribute the morality that it conveys as embedded in religious ethos and stemming from religion. See, I don't. And, and I think that's what's interesting because I see the lessons in this story taught not only in all religions, but in a lot of atheists have similar views. When you talk about atheist morality, it's something that's tossed around. And oh, that's, so- that's another conversation. I don't know what atheist morality <laughs> <laughs> and so I feel like the morals in this story are fairly universal or are, are, are much more universal than I think um, the average person recognizes. And I, I appreciated that because it made it so that anyone can read the story, whether you're Catholic or not, and still pull something out of the story. Yeah. Yeah, ready sure. to write me thing? saying that it's religious based doesn't mean that if you're not religious, you won't benefit from the story. It's just oh, like, definitely. It's like the themes. Anyway, all right, let's rate because we got yeah. yeah, yeah, we're on um, fifty-five minutes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I was just gonna say. <laughs>
Gabe's late. I know him. That's why. Gail didn't even read the story, but she will. <laughs> Especially after this conversation. So yeah. Who wants to go? Who's I, on first? I'll go. I'll, I'll, I'll go. <laughs> He didn't even get that reference because he's a young whippersnapper. I got it. What up? <laughs> What's on second? <laughs> oh. Okay, Remy. Oh, I, yeah. I said I'll give it a six. Okay. Wow. I'm giving it a six as well. So am I. Gerald. <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, but, <laughs> but it, was, it was a good little oh, story. Okay. And it, was, six, six, six. it was very well written. Um, <laughs> and, and it's a four for me. <laughs> Did you see Gail six six six? I just saw that. Oh, <laughs> I think I'm gonna leave us talking to our live listeners to see if we can pull more. We'll talk to you if you come chat at us. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> Gerald, did it go up to a four? Did you want to give it a three, but we peer pressured you? No, actually, it, it started as a four because it, it was it was really well written. So it very very wow, very we didn't well move written. him at all. Nope. <laughs> no, I was stubborn, okay. stubborn Gerald this week. <laughs> this week? see how you are no. so let's get ready for the quiz <laughs> what stories are we submitting this week well i'm going to give it a last try for snow by zhu xiaobin if i don't win win this week then it's not it's just fate it's just the higher calling <laughs> and it's not meant to be so. the podcast works in mysterious <laughs> ways it must be a horrible story <laughs> how do you Lara. Yeah, no, I was just like, mm. I got that. Actually, I'm also pulling from Granta Magazine, which possibly a little brave of me considering our experience, but I'm, um, <laughs> I'm submitting The Wig by Han Dong, so I'm also doing Chinese literature, well, Chinese author. Snows of Kilimanjaro by Ernest Hemingway. Yay! Yes. Suck up. <laughs> Charles like, yes, yeah, safe. <laughs> He's back there praying for Rami to win. <laughs> Okay, so I pulled this quiz from an online site called Fun Trivia, Religions of the World. Nice. And I looked for, a, I, I tried to figure out, like, which religious figures had been in jail and which ones hadn't. And I <laughs> realized that I'm not Rami and I'm not willing to da do that much That's work. Hard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so here we go. Um, we're going to start with Gerald because um, he had so many difficulties and he was such a hard suffering young man this yeah, week. <laughs> yeah. go on. So here we go. The name of this ancient religion comes from a Latin word meaning village dweller. Early Christians referred to its followers and were non-Christians in this way because they lived a more urbanized life centered around the Mediterranean. Later, the religion's meaning evolved to mean uncivilized or even satanic. Which religion is it? Zoroastrianism, Ekantar, shamanism, paganism. Uh, I'd say paganism. Ding! Correct. Nice. Good job, Gerald. I know my religion. I would have went for Zoroastrian. <laughs> <laughs> Anise. One of the world's most ancient religions originated in the eastern part of Iran, per, formerly Persia, and was founded by a prophet whose name in Greek was Zoroastra. His Persian name is the name of the religion. Which one? Zoroastrianism, Sikhism, Islam, Jainism. Whoa, 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 whoa. Zora. I know it's a mouthful. Come on. Yeah. You can do it. You can pronounce it. <laughs> no, is it is it Islam? Is it a change? No, it's the Zora options are Zoroastrianism, Sikhism, Islam, Jainism. Mm. This is a weird one. Is this a trick one? Is it Islam? You can't ask. Just I, answer the what? I'm just gonna go. I'm just gonna go with it. I have no idea. Is it? What are you going with? Islam. Why not? Really? I really? don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> Of the prophet is in the name of oh, the religion. I thought, <laughs> oh, I totally the answer the question. I, to, I thought you were saying it like it changed over through. time. It Why was would you like give me the answer? In a field, girl. <laughs> it was so I thought I thought you were saying that it like changed, like it started and then it changed. I, okay, this is what that was you know religions change names. Argue. That was very cute. <laughs> yes, I misunderstood the question. Okay, Remy. 
This monotheistic religion was founded in the 16th century by Guru Nanak in Punjab, India. Today, many of its followers can be found worldwide. Which religion is it? Taoism, Hinduism, Sikhism, Baha'i. All right, let me just point out the difference of difficulty between this question and the previous question. Hey, she still didn't get it. I didn't it. even <laughs> understand it, Remy. All right. Okay. okay. Um, all right, so you said 1600s. 16th century. 16th century. By Guru Nanak in yeah. Punjab, India. Today, yeah. many of its followers can be found worldwide. Yeah, Sikhism. And the answer is correct. Great. Good job, Rami, Thank complaining you. about the difficulty and still getting it right. Yeah. <laughs> well, all right, let's just go. <laughs> Gerald, yeah. one of India's oldest religions, grew with Hinduism but was influenced by Buddhism. The leader was Mahav Mahavira, although Rishabha is considered to be the traditional founder. Which religion is it? Jainism, Taoism, Shinto, Yoruba? Could you read them again, please? Sorry. Jainism, Taoism, Shinto, Yoruba. Jainism. And the answer is correct. Oh, no. What am I going to do if you guys keep getting all the answers correct? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you make it a little easier. <laughs> yeah. It's like that time I misheard the Mad Max question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. The indigenous people of the Andes believe in an earth mother. She is the focus of Incan religious beliefs. What do the Incas call their earth mother? Pavarti, Saraswati, Pachamama, Lakshmi. Okay, I know it's not Pavarti. No, that's it. That's know. all I know. What were the other three? Not Pavarti? Saras Saraswata, Pachamama. Lakshmi. Um, Pachamama, maybe? Pachamama is correct. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, you got it. I etymology that bitch. <laughs> <laughs> that needs to be on a shirt. Like, yeah. seriously, the geekiest t shirt ever. <laughs> okay, Riley. Although this ancient religion is mostly associated with Siberia and Northern and Central Asia, it is found in many other cultures. Cave paintings have been discovered in Europe depicting followers of the religion traveling with animals and spirits. What is this religion called? Harapapa, excuse me, Harapapan, occultism, animism, shamanism. Shaman. You go with shaman? And it is correct. Okay. Oh no, we're gonna run out of questions soon. What am I Do you have a tiebreaker? <laughs> yeah, we have one final question. Because there's ten questions, so three, six, nine. So here we go. We'll just use the last question as a tiebreaker. We can do this. Yo. An ancient civilization existed from thirty three hundred to thirteen hundred BCE in what is now Pakistan. It later fell, it fell to the Aryans who invaded their homeland from Mesopotamia. These ancient people had their own belief system and followed the Vedic texts, which led to a religion called Brahmanism, which in turn became Hinduism as we know it today. What was the name of the civilization? Herapapan, Manichaean, Minoan, Olmec. Um, I don't know. I'll say the third one. Minoan? Yeah. No, it's not. No, it's not. Of course it isn't. <laughs> it's it's Hara <laughs> yeah. Wrong, Wrong end of the world. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. You did good up until then. Okay. <laughs> Let's do this. Let's do this. Monotheism is the defining characteristic of this religion. For the followers of this religion, God is its sovereign creator, ruler, sustainer, and savior. This same God revealed himself to Moses in a burning bush at Mount Sinai. The Talmud is the core text of this religion. Which religion is it? Creative movement, Islam, Judaism, Rastafarianism. 
Why is Rastafarian the minute list? Um, it's a religion. Judaism? <laughs> <laughs> Correct. What do you mean? Why is Rastafarianism on that list? It's so out of the blue. It doesn't. It's not even. <laughs> no, it is. It it is. The, the it is. It is. But... Believe in Moses and Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, they do. They believe a lot of other stuff. In <laughs> Judaism, anyway. <laughs> Rami, <laughs> yep. are you ready? All right. Again, it's for the win, Rami. Extremely difficult. Actually, yeah, it is. It's for the win. It All is right. for the win. Mm -hmm. Another of the ancient religions is Islam. The main Muslim populations are located across North Africa, the Middle East, Central and South Asia, and Southeast Asia. There are two major forms of Islam today. One is Sunni and the other is called... Really? Really? <laughs> Did you give that one to Rami? Zakat? Yeah. Salafi? Shia. 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 <laughs> I know. Hey, it was the luck of the draw. I did them in order. It was the luck of the draw. So, Rami, what are we reading next week? Snows of Kilimanjaro by Ernest Hemingway. And it's Look at Gerald. Gerald <laughs> that is oh, Gerald's so Hemingway nice. happy Hemingway dance. <laughs> Gerald can get a Hemingway <laughs> fanboy shirt. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Rami. <laughs> But before you go, leave your comments and confessions at literaryroadhouse.com. The regulations are simple. Leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spreaker, and help others like your gardener friend find our show. This show is also part of a network of priests and podcasts, including the Literary Roadhouse Book Club and the Bradbury Challenge. And as always, share this podcast with your parishioners. Until next time, read a good read story. A good story. <laughs> <laughs> You're so awesome. <sighs> Love it.